We start the day with some breaking football news. The CFP Board of Managers announcing within the last hour that it has approved the tweak to the 12-team format for the event, which begins this coming season. The playoff will now include the top five highest-ranked conference champs rather than the six highest-ranked conference champs. This obviously an adjustment due to the demise of the Pac-12. It still guarantees at least one non-power conference team will make the field. The other seven spots will be filled by at-large teams. The previous format had six at-larges. And with that, we welcome you in. It is Big Ten today on a Tuesday. Dave Revson and Trent Meacham. We prepare to tip off a week of midweek Big Ten basketball. You've got all 14 teams set to play over the next three days. We'll get to all those games coming up, but a lot of intrigue as we continue to kind of jockey for position here down the stretch. There is, and I love it. Just when we thought Purdue was running away, this is their title. And now all of a sudden, Illinois is right there, just a game behind them in the loss column. We have some other teams surging. So the next few weeks, Dave, I think are going to be really fun to, to, to stay tuned for. Yeah, there is a lot still hanging in the balance, no doubt. And we're going to get to some of those games coming up in the next couple days in a moment. But we want to start you with our big story, and that is a roster move. Penn State coach Mike Rhodes announcing yesterday that his team's leading scorer, Kanye Clary, is no longer with the team. Rhodes characterized the move as, quote, coach's decision. Clary was a bit player on last year's team, but had emerged as the most improved scorer in the Power Five this season. He missed a couple games with an injury a couple weeks ago that Penn State won, had played somewhat sparingly since then in his return. It is odd timing. It does feel, though, a little bit like it had built up over time, just if you were to read between the lines of some of the things Rhodes said. And it was somewhat cryptic, frankly, uh, when he announced that Clary was no longer with the team. But kind of big picture here, what does this mean for Penn State now as they head down the stretch without their leading scorer? Yeah, first off, wish Clary the best, talented player. I, I would say also for Mike Rhodes, you know, new coach, establishing a new culture. I don't know the details, but I have a lot of respect for a coach that's willing to do this to maybe your most talented player, your leading scorer. I think obviously Mike Rhodes is, is building something new. Um, in state college so I, I respect that moving forward this year this is still a very dangerous team won a few games with Clary out of the lineup yeah. and I think it, it it gives a little bit more clarity to the roles um, Ace Baldwin he's their point guard he's most effective with the ball in his hands on the offensive end he doesn't have to share those duties as much with Kanye Clary I think that helps his game he's been playing very well as of late you scratch that game against Nebraska where uh, they just ran away with them in Lincoln but it gives more clarity they would still have good depth from the guards DeMarco Dunn uh, Jamil Brown's making shots so they're playing well I think they're going to be a team that's going to cause some issues for other opponents here to, to finish off the season we're not more than a couple weeks removed from them being the team that no one wanted to play they won three in a row two of those were the games where Clary was sidelined as yep. I mentioned and I had them in the first game they lost after that three-game win streak. It was at Northwestern, but they gave them a heck of a game. And Rhodes was talking before that, you know, well, hey, what's been different here? He said the ball's been moving really well. And so, again, is that a comment on Clary or not? I don't know. But it does show you that they could play really well without him, kind of regardless of, of what you read into that context. So, no doubt, I agree with you, this can still be a really scary team. We'll see if they can get back on track Tomorrow night, they play against Illinois. They will play that game at Rec Hall on campus, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But let's get into tonight's action. And we have two key games in the battle for the double buys in the Big Ten tourney. Michigan State hosting Iowa. The Spartans are playing great. They've won five of six. And then the late game is Maryland traveling to Wisconsin. Badgers trying to get back on track. They have lost five of six. Let's start in East Lansing. You got Iowa. They're coming off their first quad one win of the year, Trent. They really played well against Wisconsin, got it to overtime, got the win. They've got a home stretch here for their last five or quad one games. I, I don't want to overstate the chances here for Iowa. I mean, they're in nobody's bracket right now. It would be a miraculous run for them to get in. But they do have some opportunities here, starting with this game in East Lansing against the Spartans team that just feels like it has hit its stride. Yeah, uh, Michigan State's playing like we maybe expected to, them to early this season. 
Now, a week ago, Dave, I said, hey, these two teams were ones that I, I see, could see making a run. And now yeah. we see Iowa coming off that big win against Wisconsin in overtime. I love how they're playing the three-guard lineup of Perkins, Sanford, and Dix. They combined for 53 points against the Badger defense. And then Owen Freeman as, as your center. He went for 20 and 12, six assists, four blocks. This guy, you know, he, he's going to be the freshman of the year in this league. Right. I think he'll be an All-American. I think he'll play at the next level. I think we're going to see his game expand. But right now as a freshman, he's already more advanced than most post players in our league. And Michigan State, they're going to have their hands full with Freeman in the low post with his skill level, with his motor. So I think that's going to be critical for Michigan State. Can they somewhat contain the talented freshman for, in order for them to get a win. And you have to deal with Ben Cricky as well. I mean, this front line for Iowa is really formidable. They're just a good offensive team, right? I mean, they've got players who can score at every position. It does feel like a little bit of a strength versus strength game. Iowa is so good offensively. Michigan State has been outstanding defensively. And for their lack of production in the low post, and they don't get a whole lot out of that center position. We've talked about it all year. They're good enough defensively in the post. That, that's not an area where they suffer. So, to me, that feels like the matchup here is kind of what gets the upper hand. Is it Iowa's offense or is it Michigan State's defense? Yeah, and that's going to be fun to watch. I think this game will be fun because both these teams do want to play fast. They play a little bit differently. Iowa's very free-flowing. Free Michigan State's a bit more disciplined. But I think that's where the Spartans have the edge is on the defensive end, Dave, as you mentioned. And, and recently, I, I felt like their aggressiveness, the pressure that they played, when they go to the bench, you insert a guy like Trey Holloman. And now he, he picks it up even more. Cooper off the bench is a guy that can move, that can use his length. So them defensively, I think that's what's going to make it hard for the Hawkeyes. Now, if the Hawkeyes can put together 40 minutes, which they haven't done lately, they played great in halves, I think this could be a great game. And, and Cricky, you know, has fallen off a little bit with his production. Yeah. For Iowa, though, they're going to have to contain Malik Hall. He, he's been a first-team All-Big Ten player uh, recently. The last three games, over 23 points, shooting over 73, uh, 70% from the field. I mean, he, he's done it in so many different ways. They give him the ball in the low post. He can face up and drive, knocking down some threes as well. I love how he's playing. He's the key for Michigan State. A great backcourt. If they have a go-to guy now as a forward, kind of a hybrid type of player, and Cricky and the Hawkeyes, maybe we'll see Patrick McCaffrey match up with him a bit. They're going to have their hands full with, with Malik Hall. Yeah, Malik Hall's been great. Double figures 10 of the last 11 games. And you mentioned Iowa haven't been a great road team. I mean, they're 2-7. and seven on the road but last three road losses for them they've led in the second half this has been a competitive team you know they're going to give Michigan State a run here and again feeling good about themselves heading into this one Maryland going to Wisconsin Badgers maybe not feeling great about themselves I mean they've lost five of six here now you get a Maryland team that defends really well home or road I mean you look at their road numbers defensively and they are tremendous the issue is uh, issue scoring the ball yes uh, on the road and frankly at times at home but Wisconsin you, you know this is a team that offensively just felt like at the beginning of the year was clicking on all cylinders I know they scored well against Iowa but as a general rule haven't here lately what do you see as the key matchup here well this is going to be tough for, for Wisconsin I know you, you mentioned Maryland's playing better on the road they have some big road wins like that that game in Champaign against the Illini I, I thought they gave Illinois all they could handle uh, this week and so I, I think Maryland's going to – they could steal one tonight in, in Madison. Uh, their, their strength defensively across the board, their quickness, how they play in the gaps is as good as it gets around the country. Wisconsin, we've seen Crowell be more aggressive offensively. I like that, 22 points against Iowa. Chucky Hepburn, he had 18 against Iowa. I like seeing those guys be more aggressive. But now it seems like, uh, you know, Tyler Wall, Max Klesman have fallen off. They need a full collective effort, okay? Everybody doesn't have to score 15, but they need across the board these guys to be playing aggressive. they got to knock down some shots, too. They've really struggled shooting the ball outside of that game from Iowa. We'll see if seeing some of those three balls go in, if that could give them some momentum going forward. But uh, Maryland, I, I think their defense is going to be really challenging for, for Wisconsin tonight. It's been interesting to see you mentioned Klesmed, and he was playing so well. I mean, there weren't many players in the Big Ten playing better than him for a stretch in January. But now these last three games, he's only scored 15 points, 5 of 27 from the field in that stretch. And he was such an important part of this team when they were playing well. Just in general, Trent, I mean, if you look at Wisconsin from the beginning of the year up until February 1st, 
They were seventh in the nation in offensive efficiency. Since February 1st, they're 10th in the Big Ten in offensive efficiency. Is there anything you can put a finger on? I mean, again, like, yeah, Klesman hasn't played great. I mean, Hepburn again, like, individually, is it, is it just a function of that or is there something going on that people kind of solve part of the riddle? It's a great question, Dave. I, I think there's so many things. I'd first start defensively. I don't think they've been as good defensively. I think if they shore that up, then maybe you can get out and transition. They have done. They did that better early in the season. This, that's not what we would say maybe a Wisconsin team's past, but they can get out and run, especially with a guy like A.J. Storr. So I'd like to see them better on that end of the floor. And then, look, I just think it's, it's, it's a long season. You go through ups and downs. We'll see if they can come together here late February into March, if Klesmet can knock down some shots, if a siege off the bench. Obviously, John Blackwell, yeah. you know, he, he was banged up there. And, and he was a bigger piece than maybe we realized, having his defensive ability, having his shot making out on the court. So, you know, some of these guys have stepped up that weren't playing as well offensively. Some of the other guys have fallen off. We'll see. Now's the time to get going. It's not a great opponent to do that against no. in Maryland, but if they can get some momentum tonight, see some shots go down, I like them moving forward, but they got to turn around right away. Maryland outstanding defensively, as you said. It's going to be interesting to see if they can get uh, contributions from more than just the big three. I mean, that to me was what stood out in that game against Illinois where they were really competitive, but you score 80 points and 63 of them are from three guys. Can someone else... Deshaun Harris-Smith, can he be a guy who steps up and, and has a big game for you? That's, that's been the, the, the key for them all season because Young is as good of a point guard as you have. Reese has been consistent. He's got to stay out of foul trouble. I think Harris-Smith is the guy. His 17 against Iowa, that's what put them over the, the, the top in that game. Jamie Kaiser has seemed to shoot the ball with a bit more confidence. So can somebody on Maryland knock down some shots, give the other guys a little bit of reprieve offensively if they do that? This team, they can pr they prove they can beat anybody. Challenging week here for Maryland. Couple road games are at Wisconsin, then they head to Rutgers over the weekend. Back on Big Ten today, we look at the top scores in conference play in the league. The top four, kind of the usual suspects, all preseason, all conference players in the Big Ten. The fifth guy has really burst on the scene this year, Marcus Damask, one of the top ten scores all time at Southern Illinois, and his game has translated beautifully to the Big Ten. He joins us now. He is our big interview. And Marcus, transitioning from a mid-major to a high major is supposed to be tough. How have you managed to do it so seamlessly? Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, the coaches and my teammates have put a lot of confidence in me, uh, and they, they want me to be aggressive. So, you know, I think there was definitely a transition period, but for the most part, I'm just listening to my teammates and my coaches. I want to uh, ask you about that shiner you're sporting right now. You got an elbow from Dante Scott in the Maryland game. Uh, how have you managed to uh, deal with that here over the last few days? Yeah, it's, it's been a lot of icing, uh, trying to get the swelling down. When it first happened, it was really affecting my vision. It, you know, it bumped up right here a lot, but you know, it's it's not too bad anymore. It's just pretty black now. I there you are uh, sporting it in, in the post game and and talking about it, it was worth it to get a win on the road. And you guys have had some trouble closing out games. I was really impressed with the way you did it against Maryland. You think about uh, the game against Nebraska. You let them get close there. That game went to overtime. Michigan State obviously slipped away late. What did it mean to go on the road, be in a hostile environment? And Maryland has proven to be a very difficult place for teams to win here over the last few years and to be able to come away with a win. Yeah, it meant a lot. You know, it was it was a hostile environment. You know, they had some special stuff for their their students, their fans. So, you know, it was it was pretty packed in there. And for us to kind of come out with the win, you know, I think we just showed a lot of maturity and, you know, our defense was a lot better closing games than it had been in the past. One of the things that's really impressed me, Marcus, in watching you this year is how your role has kind of evolved on this team in season. And some of it kind of seemed to be by necessity. Obviously, Terrence Shannon was suspended for a pretty significant chunk of time. It felt like you played, to me at least, a slightly different role when Terrence was out than since he's been back. How have you seen it? How have you seen kind of your role change over the course of the year? Yeah, my role has definitely changed. Uh... Without Terrence, you know, you you lose a, a really good playmaker. So, 
my role, I kind of had to play make a little more, create for myself, create for others a little more. But now with Terrence back, you know, I, I kind of had to find that balance of, you know, playing off the ball, playing on the ball, being aggressive when I needed to. But, you know, it's, it's Terrence Shannon. Like, I got to defer to him. So <laughs> just kind of finding that balance uh, that will help the team. We talked about your win over Maryland. The other big development from your guys' perspective this weekend was Purdue losing to Ohio State. And now all of a sudden you're a game behind Purdue in the Big Ten standings. You still have a home game against the Boilermakers. So if you take care of business the rest of the way, you could end up tying Purdue for the Big Ten regular season title. To what extent have you guys discussed that possibility? Yeah, um, I mean, we've all seen it. You know, it's, it's not like we don't know about it, but we haven't talked about it a whole lot because, you know, we got a lot of games before that. And, you know, we just got to take care of our business. You know, now we, we really don't have to worry about what anybody else does. You know, it's just what we do, and we just got to take care of our business. Marcus, as I mentioned, first year in the Big Ten for you. Want to get a little bit into your background. You're from Wapen, Wisconsin, which is between Madison and Green Bay. Your father was your high school coach. You have a number of siblings who play basketball as well. Give people a sense for the role of basketball in your house. Yeah, I mean, basketball has been a huge part of my life growing up. You know, I was in the gym with all of my older siblings. I got two older sisters and an older brother. So I was in the gym with all of them growing up. My dad coached all of us. So, I mean, we're kind of known as the basketball family back in Wapan. I read that you have a court in your basement Explain to me what that was like growing up for a kid who loved the game. Yeah, I mean, that was awesome. You know, we we built our house kind of right as I was being born. And, you know, my dad had the idea to dig deep into the ground. So we kind of have like the size of a racquetball court in our basement, you know, with a hoop that can raise 10 feet to I think like seven, seven and a half feet. So I've played a, a lot of games down there, a lot of one-on-one -on -one with my brother, a lot of 2v2 tournaments, you know, just I grew up in that gym. You have a reputation as being a really hard worker, as someone who loves being in the gym, loves being in the gym alone. How much do you think that setup as a kid impacted that, the, the fact that you had essentially 24-hour access to a gym? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it did a lot. You know, I wouldn't call it 24-hour because – at night, my mom, she didn't like the ball bouncing too much when she was trying to sleep. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I could really go in there whenever I want. You know, if I got bored, I just went in the gym. Like, it's it's really, if I didn't know what to do, I would just go in the gym. So that's just kind of how I grew up, and that's just kind of how I am now. If I don't know what to do, I just go in the gym. By the way, that seems like a reasonable request from mom. I mean, I think not wanting a basketball bouncing in the house when you're trying to fall asleep, just – from the point of view of a parent, again, I, I can relate to that, no doubt. Uh, I, I'm interested in your recruitment. So you're the MVP of the state championship game in Wisconsin as a freshman. Then you're Mr. Basketball in the state of Wisconsin. And I looked at your recruiting rankings, and it just doesn't add up, Marcus. I mean, you, you're very lightly recruited. Why do you think that was? Well, where was the, the disconnect there for coaches? Um, honestly, you know, I was just, I wasn't as athletic as everybody else. You know, I, I had decent size, but, you know, I wasn't just a lot taller than everybody else. You know, I think a lot of people just looked at me, you know, just on how I looked like, honestly, you know, I didn't look like, you know, a high major athlete that could play with some of the guys that are here. So I think, it, you know, people just kind of judged me quick and, you know, they didn't really let my game, you know, speak for itself. So you end up going to Southern Illinois, and, man, I mean, I, you know, looking at your roster last year, you guys had Lance Jones on the roster, of course, having a great year at Purdue. You're having a great year at Illinois. Xavier Johnson, not the one at Indiana, but the one who's still at Southern Illinois, is one of the most prolific scorers in the country this year. I, I mean, I don't mean to dredge up past situations, but how did you guys not make the tourney with the three of you out there? I mean... Yeah, you know, we had a solid team, uh, but the Valley's tough. You yeah, know, it's it's hard. It's hard to make the tournament when you got a one bid league, and you know, there's other good teams. You know, Drake was really good. Bradley was really good with Frank Mass. Uh, you know, it's the Valley. The Valley's no joke.
No, that's for sure. And, and you know, you bring that up and you talk about some of those other guys. I mean, Rink Mass, Ben Crickey's had a really good year. He came from the Valley as well. For people who maybe don't understand, like, how good the Valley is and are seeing it with these individuals coming to the Big Ten, give us a sense of, like, the, the night to night, how good the competition was there. Uh, I mean, it was tough. You know, it, it's honestly, you know, it's a similar league to the Big Ten, you know, in terms of play style. You know, it's physical. And uh, there's really, there's no easy games. You know, when you go on the road, a, a lot of times the home team wins. So road games were tough to come by. You know, now you're you're bringing in guys that are high major, you know, have a lot of high major success to your home court. You know, it's just, it's a battle. So you went into the portal after graduating from SIU and, again, having a really great career there. Why did you choose Illinois? Uh, I chose Illinois because, you know, my, my first priority on my list was I wanted to go to a place where I could win games. You know, and I felt like just with Illinois and the roster that they had and the coaches that they had, you know, I felt like we could, you know, win important games here. So that was number one. And then number two was I felt like this was a place where I could get better as a basketball player. You know, looking forward to my future. You know, I just want to continue to improve every day, and I felt like Illinois had everything that I needed for that. Are you surprised that, you know, when we show a list of the top five scores in conference play in the Big Ten, like if someone would have asked you at the beginning of the year, hey, it's going to be the end of February, where do you think you'll land among the top conference scores in the Big Ten? Would you have said fifth? Uh, no, probably not. Uh, <laughs> no, I knew, I knew coming here that I would be able to impact this team. You know, I didn't know to what caliber, and I probably didn't expect to be, you know, in the top five points. But, you know, I think it, it's just a testament to what happens when you put in the work. You know, I think I just put in the work every day, and I trust the work. One thing that's been really impressive, and I think it's been obvious to anyone who watches your game, the FAU game is probably the one that jumps out the most, is the work that you do inside the arc. Tell us how that part of your game evolved, because to me it's your greatest strength. Yeah, I think I think that just comes back to, you know, being coached by my dad. Uh, you know, he was big on the fundamentals and just kind of mastering the boring of the game. You know, the two foot jump shots, fit, the footwork, shot fix, stuff like that. Uh, and just playing at my own point, own pace, you know, just not letting anyone speed me up, you know, and just having complete control when I get the ball to where I want to get it to. Marcus, I want to leave you with this. You guys have Penn State coming up tomorrow. You're playing at Rec Hall, as I'm sure you know, which is a much smaller, more intimate facility. They've got really tough guards. Those guys like to, to get up in your grill. What are you anticipating in this matchup in State College? Yeah, I think it's going to be a fun one. You know, I think the environment's going to, going to be really live in there. You know, I think it's already sold out. Um, you know, it's a game that we got to execute our, our game plan and, and we got to play really hard if we want to come out with a win. All right, Marcus, really enjoyed visiting with you. Take care of the Shiner, and we'll look forward to seeing you here on the Big Ten Network tomorrow night. Yes, sir. Thank you. Speaking of Northwestern, the school named Tim Nolan is its new volleyball coach earlier this month. Nolan coming to NU from Grand Canyon has been the coach there the last eight seasons. The Antelopes won better than 72% of their games over his final Five years in Phoenix, breaking through this season to make their first ever NCAA tourney. And Tim Nolan, kind enough to join us now. Uh, Coach, welcome to the Big Ten. Welcome to the Big Ten Network. What appealed to you most about this opportunity at Northwestern? Well, you know, there's so much to love, but being at an elite school like Northwestern in the best conference uh, for women's volleyball in the country in the Big Ten, and having that support network with an administration that is incredibly invested and this, the caliber of student athletes here is just incredible. You know, we just came out of practice a little bit ago and, and they're just such great, young, vibrant people. I, I felt like this was a great opportunity for me to come here uh, with my family and build a program here that is going to represent Chicago and this university at the highest level. We well, built quite a program at Grand Canyon, and it was an interesting evolution. I mean, you took over a program that was transitioning from Division Two to Division One, so I imagine there's a lot of complications in there, just in terms of getting a, a better caliber of player to compete at a higher level, and then just gradually got better and better, culminated, in, as I said, in that NCAA tournament 
bid this past year. What are you proudest of that you accomplished there, Coach? You know, I'm, I'm proudest of the student athletes and their commitment to each other. Uh, they excelled in the classroom. We impacted Greater Phoenix with our, our community service and our relations with the community uh, and watching them go out and then compete at the highest level. And, you know, NC2A tournament, we played the number 10 team in the country uh, at their place and stood toe to toe. With, you know, second set went to extras. And I felt like we had opportunities that uh, we put ourselves in a great, a great piece, but just really proud of the evolution of that program and the, and the student athletes commitment to it uh to building a foundation that that program is going to live on for for years to come so now you take over at northwestern and the program has been reasonably competitive here over the last few years but they haven't had a winning record in conference play in the big 10 since the 1980s so you've mentioned look it's a really difficult league Maybe that's more of a, a commentary on how good the league is th than on Northwestern. But what's the formula there, do you think, for getting Northwestern to a point where it competes in the top half of the league? Well, you summed it up really well. I mean, this league is a monster. And next year, it's only getting better. Um, and so I, I think the formula for Northwestern is really specific. We need to recruit uh, the elite kids in the country out of high school get them here, train them, develop them, invest in them, pour into them, uh, make sure they experience all the incredible things that this university has to offer. Uh, and then we're going to graduate them. And along the way, we're going to try and win some championships. Uh, you know, there's no quick formula for anything. I think building a program, not just a team, but a program is a process. And we've already started the process here. Uh, you know, just investing in the current student athletes we have and going out and recruiting hard this past weekend and, and looking at how we can fill out the roster for next fall. But again, it we're building a program here and it's not just a, a one season thing. I want to build a program here that can have sustainable and repeatable success. You know, Northwestern went two months without a coach. This was a prolonged search. What was your first order of business when you got there, just in terms of connecting with the players and getting them to feel like they were moored at the school yeah you know it, it's developing those relationships with student athletes uh the programs i run are very relationship driven it's really important that the student athletes know we care about them they're not just commodities uh they're people we want to invest in them we want to help them grow and develop in life as well as volleyball and i think uh just starting that relationship process as soon as i got hired you know we've been meeting with players zooms face to face uh, just making sure we get to know each other and building that relationship and that trust. Well, let's get to know you a little bit. You are a West Coast guy through and through. You grew up in California. You went to USC and Pepperdine. You've been an assistant at both of those schools and then your time at Grand Canyon as well. What is this move to the Midwest? Like, how, how do you view coming to a completely different part of the country? You know, for, for my family and I, it was a great opportunity. Chicago is a world-class city. We, we're not moving to, uh, you know, the middle of nowhere. We're, we're moving to one of the best cities in the country uh, to be one of the best universities in the country. I mean, it's a no-brainer. You were an associate head coach for three years at USC, included national championships in there. You know, USC obviously coming into the league next year. Northwestern actually hosts USC next season. Again, you went to school there. Have you allowed your mind to wander at all about what that's going to be like? Oh, it's going to be incredible. You know, it's going to be a great high-level volleyball match. Uh, USC is an incredibly storied program that, you know, I had the honor of, of being part of some of that history and, you know, hanging a couple banners on the wall and going to some Final Fours and a national championship. And I can't wait to get them here in Chicago and show them how we're going to do things here. So it's interesting to look at kind of that West Coast experience that you have, Coach. And as you mentioned, look, the, the league is expanding, obviously, USC and UCLA, but also Oregon and Washington as well. How could that familiarity with that area of the country help you in terms of opening up new recruiting areas and also just kind of the notion of, you know, these schools, you know, these programs? Sure. I, th I think it's all valuable experience. I mean, we're going to recruit coast to coast. Uh, we're going to search for the best athletes. Certainly having the league expand into that time zone is going to open that recruiting up, honestly, for a lot of the teams in the league. Um, we're different than all the other institutions, and we're certainly going to showcase that to the recruits we see. 
But in terms of familiarity, you know, those are all great, great established programs, incredibly competitive, incredibly high level. Um, but, you know, having familiarity with those venues, with those staffs, quite honestly, uh, I think it's going to help us. And, you know, I can't wait to get this thing started in the fall. Uh, it's going to be a building process, but we're really excited about where this is going. All right, one last question for you about your move. I, I noted that you're a big outdoorsman. You love to hike. Have you figured out how you're going to scratch that itch here in Chicago? Or are you looking around for the, the best hiking trails? Uh, I have not yet. Um, th there's some time before I'm going to go hiking out here. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're a huge outdoors family. Uh, anything we can do, I would imagine we're going to spend a lot of time at the lake and the beach uh, play some volley out there, paddleboard, do those types of things. So again, we're super excited. You know, Chicago is a world-class city and there's nothing better than Chicago and beach in the summer. It's balmy right now by Chicago standards. This, this is pretty good. You've lucked out. Uh, Tim Nolan, really a pleasure to get to visit with you a little bit. Congratulations on this new position. And we will look forward to watching the Wildcats under your tutelage. Thank you. Appreciate it. A former Nebraska women's basketball player has filed a civil suit against the school, accusing head coach Amy Williams and AD Trev Alberts, among others, of failing to protect her when a sexual relationship with a former team assistant became widely known. The player, Ashley Scoggins, said she feared retaliation if she resisted the overtures of the coach, then assistant Chuck Love. She is seeking unspecified damages from the school, for the alleged violation of her civil rights. The school said it is aware of the suit and, quote, intends to vigorously defend this matter. Love was suspended with pay in February of 2022 on the same day Scoggin was dismissed from the program. She now plays at UNLV. Love ultimately resigned several months after his suspension. Our big stat is highlighting guard play, taking a look at the leaders from that position and a number of key statistical categories. Talked about Terrence Shannon, the top scoring guard in the conference. Brooks Barnheiser is the top rebounder among those listed as pure guards. Elijah Hawkins doesn't just lead the Big Ten in assists. He leads the nation, while East Baldwin is sixth nationally in steals. Wanted to highlight the best guards. And rather than just saying, hey, here are the top guys, we thought we'd do it by categories. So let's start with a category you're calling best facilitator. So I need you to define your terms okay. first and then tell us who you're going with. We just saw Elijah Hawkins leading the country, right? I I'm going to go with Braden Smith. Okay, In conference play, he leads the, the league in assists. 7.7 7. 7 assists a game, uh, almost a 3-to-1 assist to turnover ratio. And look, I, I think Brain Smith is the best guard in the country in ball screen situations. They run that action so many times, like most teams. And of course, he's got Zach Eady to dish the ball to. But he has every read in his bag. He makes the right reads. It seems like 95% of the time or so, whether it's to Eady, whether it's the opposite side of the court, whether it's behind him, he he's, seems to be in complete control. I love the pace, the poise that he plays with. And what separates him, I think, is when he seems to get stuck. After he's picked up his dribble, he's got maybe the best pump fake in the conference and one of the best pivot foots in the conference. And he just has the patience to let the play develop before delivering that dime. And he's been great 16 assists against uh, Northwestern earlier this year. The best facilitator in our league. I'm blown away by what a great rebounder he is too. For well, he does size. a lot. Yes. Uh, I mean, he yes. is just, he is all over the court. He is really a fantastic player. And he's one of those guys who look at recruiting rankings unranked. <laughs> By rivals. Does not pass the eye test. No. Well, he can play. No, he can, he, can play. he can really play. How about the best guards coming off the bench? Okay, I, I love this tandem from Nebraska. C.J. Wilcher and Sam Hoiberg. I, I looked at this as just like the energy that they bring. These are two guys that can change the game when they, when they enter it. And, and for Sam Hoiberg, it's oftentimes defensively. It's with his enthusiasm. He's a spark plug off the bench. He'll get out in passing lanes, get steals, uh, knocks down threes, just under 40% from the three-point range, and also can put some pressure on defensive, defenses as well, kind of opportunistically getting to the basket. And then C.J. Wilcher. He's a straight microwave off the bench. 22 in that win against Wisconsin, 16 against Purdue. So Nebraska's biggest wins, it's been Wilcher that's really given them the spark off the bench, shooting 43% from three on the year. Um, a true game breaker, and that's what you want off the bench. He doesn't need to go for 20 every night, 
But on any given night, you know he's striking fear into the opponents. That tandem, I love them and what they bring off the bench. And they are work ethic guys, too. Like yes. When you cover this Nebraska team, those are the guys who are the first ones in the gym. They're the ones who you know that their teammates are turning to in big situations to kind of get them going. It, it's pretty interesting to watch that. I, I, I think those two are connected, right? Yes. Like, I don't think that's a coincidence that, that those are the kinds of guys who give you those sparks off the bench. All right, it's a late in game. You got a you got a guard who you're most confident in will get you a bucket. Who's that? There's a lot you could go to in this league, but but for me the clear answer is Boo Booey. He, he's he's a he's a giant slayer. Okay, he's done it a couple times against Purdue. He, he did it against Illinois. He's done it against Indiana last season, uh, Maryland this year, both offensively and defensively. He's a guy you need a bucket. Get Boo Booey the ball. Get out of the way. He's probably going to get it to his right hand. Probably going to shoot a floater. But even if you know what's coming, he's done it time and time again. And there's a lot of guys that I'd feel good about if I'm a head coach giving the ball to. Maybe that's Tyson Walker, Jameer Young, heck, Terrence Shannon, Marcus. Dem there's a lot of guys yes. you go to. Yeah. But if I got one chance, I'm going to give the ball to Boo Booey. When you're talking like clutch situations yes. in the league, him and Jameer Young, uh, to me, are the two that, that really stand out. And Bowie on the verge of making history, five points away from becoming Northwestern's all-time leading scorer. They got a game Thursday against Michigan, and one would think he would pass John Sherna in that game and become number one all-time. All right, how about on the other end of the court, the best defender from a guard spot in the Big Ten? Well, this guy's a, a, just an absolute pest. and One of the most intelligent players in the league, Ace Baldwin for Penn State. He had eight steals against Northwestern. He's had nine games of four or more steals, so he's a total disruptor. And he does it. I, I said he's one of the most intelligent players. His positioning, such a smart player. And then the most active hands. He will take your rock if you're not careful. He can totally eliminate uh, opposing guards and, 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 and stretches throughout games. Just, you know, an absolute pest, a disruptor. But, you know, whether it's on help side defense, whether it's locking down on the ball, despite his size, not a, not a big guy, but I just love how smart he is and how active he is with his hands. It's interesting. So I've had them twice. I had them against Purdue and Northwestern and both head coaches when you're talking to them beforehand. And, hey, how do you tell your team to prepare for this defense? Penn State throws at you. They both basically said the same thing, which is you can get past him. But I tell my guys, he's still in the play. Like, he's most dangerous when he's behind you. And I, I just don't think there's many guards you would say that about. But Baldwin is a very unusual player. Okay, now this next category, best all-around guard. So are you saying this is the best guard in the Big Ten? I don't think he's the best guard. But when I think of just he does it all. Okay. okay. And I would go to Tony Perkins. All right. He is just relentless across the board. He defends at a high level. He attacks the basket. He can finish above the rim. He can shoot the three. You know, he had a game of 15, 16 assists against Nebraska early, earlier this year. Also to stretch of five games, 20 or more points in the most recent game. Game actually made the bucket to force him to overtime against Wisconsin. Then the game winner in the closing seconds. That's who Iowa went to multiple times. So when you think of a player that just – it impacts the game across the board. He could have a big scoring night. He could not shoot the ball well, but he's still impacting the game. That's Tony Perkins. Does it night in, night out, and just absolutely relentless. That's why I'm, I'm going to say he's the best all-around guard in the Big Ten. Plays with a chip on his shoulder. Oh, yeah. And he really it. does, right? A guy who was kind of under-recruited. Iowa was his only high major offer. And you can see he spent his entire career trying to prove people wrong and, and clearly has. What about the best backcourt in general in the Big Ten? So best tandem of guards. Best backcourt. Okay, this is the team coming into the season. The question, well, who is their point guard? And I look at the Illini. But Terrence Shannon Jr., Marcus Damask, that duo is the best backcourt in our league. Uh, Terrence Shannon, the third leading scorer in conference play. Marcus Damask, the fifth leading scorer. And I just look at their – their physicality, they just overwhelm you. I mean, Terrence Shannon against Maryland in the most recent game, 29 points, 14 for 16 from the free throw line. So he just puts so much pressure on opposing defenses. Marcus Damas, 19 points, 12 rebounds. How about that from your guards? One getting the line 16 times, the other with 12 rebounds. And here's where they, they coexist really well. They're finding that flow is in the half court, it's Marcus Damask. He's a guy that Coach Underwood gets the ball to more, that they run their offense through. And in transition, there's nobody better than Terrence Shannon. I know he's, I think, second in the nation 
uh, in, in points in transition, but that doesn't account for all the free throws that he attempts. So those two together, in my eyes, the best backcourt in the Big Ten. I also think this new rule where to draw a charge, you have to be in position it helps before the <laughs> offensive player puts his, yeah. his foot down, that plant foot. I mean, it, it's hard enough with him, but I mean, to, to now have that extra split second, you have to be in front of him. It's almost impossible to, to draw a charge against him. So you would write, you know, it's interesting because there are a lot of three guard offenses in the Big Ten, right? So obviously Ty Rogers is is their starting point guard. Michigan State's got to be in that conversation as well. That's well, the other one, right? And, and here's what I what I really like about this league and even thinking ahead to March, we didn't Michigan, mention Michigan State. I didn't mention Jameer Young in, in one of these categories. So there's a lot of players. We saw Bruce Thornton being the best player on the court and right. that win over Purdue. So Every team just about, I think their coach feels pretty good about that point guard and that guard play in general. Pretty interesting, too, when you think about this has been a big man's league here for the last few years. But you look at the elite players in the Big Ten this year, outside of Zach Eady, it does feel like the guards. next group of guys on that list is guards. And again, that is unusual, not in college basketball, but it's unusual in the Big Ten here over the last few years. Pretty big upset in women's hoops last night as Illinois pounded number 14 Indiana 86 to 66, only six Illini played. They all scored in double figures, led by 22 from Makaira Cook. It was the third largest margin of victory against an AP Top 25 team in program history. Men's coach Brad Underwood among those on hand to watch it. We have a doubleheader of women's hoops tonight, starting at 7 when Sarah Williams and the Wisconsin Badgers go to the barn for a border battle matchup with the Gophers. Then at 9, Alexis Markowski in Nebraska hosting Northwestern. Big Ten women's basketball only on the Big Ten Network and the Fox Sports app. Doubleheader of men's hoops tomorrow. The Fighting Illini take on the Nittany Lions at Rec Hall. Then it's the Huskers and Hoosiers battling it out in Bloomington. Big Ten hoops presented by Ram Trucks tomorrow only on the Big Ten Network and the Fox Sports app. All right, let's start with that game, Illinois and Penn State. We talked to Marcus Damask a little bit earlier. Again, that game's at Rec Hall. It's going to be the first conference game that Penn State has played there since moving to the Bryce Jordan Center in 1996. They played a few non-conference games there, so the atmosphere's going to be cranked up. What do you think about the challenge here for the Illini? Well, the challenge is you're playing in this like high school type gym, and then combined with Penn State's pressure defense, they want to be disruptive. And if they can get Illinois out of their flow, that will be a challenge for Illinois. I, I would expect to see them maybe give Coleman Hawkins the ball to bring the ball up the court, uh, relieve the pressure from some of those guards. We talked about Ace Baldwin and the pest that he can be defensively. Now for Penn State, Zach Hicks, Nick Kern, they're playing better. They're going to simply have to rebound with Illinois. If Illinois can play in the paint and dominate the boards, it'll be tough for them. A Penn State team that is last in the Big Ten in rebound margin. They're second in the Big Ten in turnover margin, yet the last three games, all of them losses, they have committed more turnovers than their opponents. So that's the way they win is can you force Illinois into some mistakes. Nebraska and Indiana. Uh, the Huskers have yet to win a conference road game. We know the Hoosiers are scuffling. They just lost at home to Northwestern. They've been in a rough stretch here. Is this the game where Nebraska can get that elusive road win? Well, that'd be huge for them in multiple reasons. They're going to have to defend the post. Khalil Ware, 22 and 16, and Baca was a freshman, 20 in their most recent games. Uh, so Nebraska is going to have to defend the post. I would expect to see them trap, bring a lot of presence into the paint, and make Indiana knock down outside shots. On the other end, Indiana is going to have to defend the three-point line. Nebraska did not shoot it well against Penn State. Now, they play great defensively. But they make almost 10 threes a game in conference play. The best three-point shooting team in our league in terms of being aggressive to shoot threes. So, Indiana's going to have to take that away tonight or tomorrow night. So, tomorrow night, yeah. Oh, it'll be, it'll be an interesting game. I mean, I was surprised with Indiana. They had such a huge advantage against Northwestern. Just having had eight days in between games, and Northwestern had a road game at Rutgers, which was a tough physical game, and it just felt like IU would be ready to go more than they were. Not necessarily that they'd win the game, but that they'd – show up they better. gotta play with some great pride yeah. and energy i'd like to see that start on the defensive end with pressure they can do that then play inside out offensively it should be a great game tomorrow night nebraska won handily when they played in lincoln case tomanaga was fantastic but again the huskers have been a different team on the road i will see you for the tip-off show tomorrow thanks so much for watching big ten today